Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Huddle Up with Gus. I'm your host, former NFL quarterback Gus Farratt, and welcome to the new 1631 Digital News Studio. You know, some people say, no news is good news. Well, I say to those people, you've never read 1631digitalnews.com. Go to 1631digitalnews.com to get your latest news, sports, music, and entertainment. And maybe even listen to your favorite podcast, Huddle Up with Gus. Check it out today at www.1631digitalnews.com. Huddle Up with Gus is brought to you by Vegas Sports Advantage. Clients of Vegas Sports Advantage are winning big in 2021, and you can be a part of the winning too. As of June 1st, $100 bettors are up $3,700. $500 bettors are up $18,500. And $1,000 bettors are up $37,000. And $5,000 bettors are up $185,000. Become a client today by clicking the link in the description below. And use promo code HUDDLEUP to take 25% off your package today. Thanks to our partnership. Welcome to what surely will be a doozy of a matchup right here, sports fans. Whether your game is on the gridiron, at the diamond, or on the links, we can only say... Welcome to this week's Huddle Up with Gus. 15-year NFL quarterback Gus Barat's passion for sports has taken him on the field and behind the benches, playing for seven NFL franchises with 114 TDs under his belt. Gus knows who the players are and how the games are won. Oh, it's not every day you get to hang out with an NFL quarterback, huh? Okay, sports fans, from the decked out and plush 1631 Digital Studios, it's kickoff time. So snap your chin straps on and get ready to huddle up with Gus. Strange variety, but again, a big play to a left Thank you. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Huddle Up with Gus. I'm your host, Gus Farratt. Thanks for joining me here in the 1631 Digital News Studio. As you can see, it's not a real studio, but we appreciate 1631 Digital News for having us all the time. And uh, I want to thank my team, Terry and Brian and Ian Kist. Uh, Ian is no longer going to be with us. He's moving on to uh, bigger and better things. So good luck with everything, Ian. And um, I want to thank Sounder FM for uh, always hosting our podcast on their platform. And we want to um, welcome our new partner. Uh, hold on. I got to look. It's I can't remember their name. Terry, you got to remind me. Um, it's I think it's Vegas Sports Betting. Is that right? Ba- Vegas Sports Advantage. Uh, dot com. So if you're willing to uh, spend some of your money and, and win some on betting and, and maybe our next guest will will help you on who you need to choose uh, <laughs> to, to bet on. But um, go to Vegas Sports Advantage, put some money in They're They're helping people win a lot of a lot of money and they're doing a great job. So thank you to Vegas Sports Advantage for that. So our guest today, um, Andy Martino, he's a, an analyst and he's a writer for SNY Network in New York, and he covers Major League Baseball. Andy, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Gus. How are you? I'm doing well. So tell us a little bit where you are right now. It's pretty exciting, actually. Yes. I'm at, I'm in the back of the press box at Yankee Stadium. Uh, almost every Zoom, whether it's public or private, that I've done or any virtual uh, uh, interview or meeting has obviously been in my basement for quite a long time. <laughs> uh, so it's nice to be a live sporting event that I get to cover and, and do my job. We're slowly all getting back to normal here. which It's uh, a little different than your basement, I assume. A little more energy. A little yeah, more energy in the little. building than in, in my house. Yeah, so who are the Yankees playing today? Yankees have the Royals uh, tonight, uh, trying to put some consistency together. It's been a tough year so far. One step forward, two steps back. But Garrett Cole on the mound tonight against Kansas City. Oh, man, Garrett Cole. So I live in Pittsburgh. I've always been a Pirate fan. Mm-hmm. And um, you cover, you follow Major League Baseball. You know how hard that is. Um, and Garrett Cole was always one of my favorites. And, you know, uh, obviously he's with a really good team now. But, uh, you know, what is going on with Garrett Cole? I mean, there's been all this crazy. I, I have, I've tried to follow it, and you know, no, not so. Is is Garrett Cole going to have a great night, or is he going to be without without all this crazy right. circumstance going on with him? You know, I think what you just said, Gus, that you're trying to follow it, and you're obviously a knowledgeable uh, fan and consumer of sports, and the fact that it's kind of hard to figure out what the scandal is. I think that's yeah. what helps baseball players like Cole or anybody else who's linked 
to what's been going on is that it doesn't really capture the public imagination like the steroid scandal or the sign stealing scandal. It's definitely been a story, but basically you've got uh, pitchers who were using things like pine tar and sunscreen and rosin for years for grip on the baseball right? against the rules, but it wasn't enforced. It was kind of one of those gamesmanship uh, situations. And over the past couple of years is, is the materials that you can use have improved. Guys have right. used gluey, sticky substances like one called spider tack, which is more than just helping with the grip. It's helping with the spin on the ball. And it's part of the reason why sliders – that become so much more biting and forcing fastballs up in the zone and have more spin. And right. it's helped such a high percentage of pitchers that, you know, in Cole's defense and anyone else's defense who's become kind of identified with it. It's like so systemic that the league is just trying to now get this stuff off the baseballs in general. Yes. Garrett Cole is one of many pitchers for sure. Whose uh, spin rates have gone down over the past couple of weeks, maybe not as dominant as, as, uh, any pitcher may have been with some of this stuff, but now following the rules and operating at least in a level, a level playing field with all other pitchers. Cause they're really checking, checking belts, checking hats, checking gloves. Oh yeah. I saw they, they checked the Grom. Yeah. Was it yesterday or day before? Like yesterday, they really yeah. went over everything. Um, and that's why I never got like, um, you know, if a ball, well, they, they throw a new ball in, it hits the dirt one time, they get rid of it and they get a new ball. You know, and then like they won't let that happen, but they were letting these other things happen. I don't know. I, I liken it to football in a way that, you know, back in the day it was like defense, we were gonna win three nothing, and now it's like thirty-five to thirty, thirty two, you know what I mean. It, the scores have gone up. Right. And, change. Yeah. Yeah. And I I think in baseball now that the pitchers, you know, if they're gonna have less spin rate and throw the ball over the plate a little more and guys are gonna hit more dingers, I think it may even help the game. Oh, I agree. That's one of the reasons why MLB decided to crack down is because we're seeing so many strikeouts that you go to a ball game. If you take your kid to a ball game, he's on the basic level, wants to see action, not pitching dominance necessarily, not yeah. strategy, but just hit the ball, run, run from first to second, try to leg out a triple, you know, the exciting stuff. And there's been not enough of that. So baseball has been really brainstorming. How can we create more contact? And sure enough, since this has been an issue and talked about and pitchers have been in theory cutting back on the stuff they've been using over the past couple of weeks, you see more offense. Yeah. You know, and do you think there will be an asterisk on this year? Because, you know, we had some perfect games and things at the beginning of the year, uh, you know, where there were no hitters and things. And do you think, so do you think there'll be an asterisk, you know, when you go back and look at uh, the history of the game in, in 2021, do you think there'll be an asterisk for this year? It's a good question. I, I I think people in the know will know, but I also think, Gus, that this was more of like, you know, something can become a news story for a couple of weeks, gets all the attention. It's great. It's something to talk about. But again, like we look back at McGuire and Sosa in 98, and that in everyone's mind has an asterisk because it was a steroid right. team, home run chase. I just don't know. If you have to explain for like 60 seconds what Sticky Stuff does to the lay person, <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure how much people are going right. to care on the line. A little different than shoving a needle in your exactly. butt, right? right? Yeah. So, so Andy, tell me a little bit about where you grew up and how you fell in love with sports and why you became a writer. Sure, that's a great. I, I love that question. Not one I've had. Uh, we're talking about the book. I grew up in Rochester, New York, where there was one of the oldest ballparks in America called Silver Stadium. It was built in the early 20th century. It's not there anymore. But when I was a kid, my dad right. would take me to one game after another uh, all summer long every year. Triple A baseball affiliate of the Orioles at that time. And what that intimate AAA experience, if you grew up in a minor league town, probably does, is you actually get to know the players every year. Like the team ran a camp, you know, when you were on summer vacation and you met the guys and they tossed your ball right. before games or whatever. And it was just so much more personal. That probably gave me a quicker feel in my life for how much I wanted to be around the game and around sports and interact with the players and learn more. Uh, so that that was something. I also grew up in Rochester. You know, you're just a little you're not far from from where the Buffalo Bills play. And right. I do remember the painful experience of sitting in that all concrete bowl during like a December game in the early 90s as a kid. What do you mean? Buffalo's you know, really warm. In the oh, winter. yeah. Yeah. Really ideal conditions. So those are my two sports experiences. They, growing up. They've never, yeah, they never had to use heavy equipment to move snow in Buffalo. 
<laughs> no, 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 never, never. The Rochester or Syracuse either. That's the little wing of the wing of the world I grew up in. So you appreciate yeah, they, baseball in the summer. They just have the massive front loaders that got to plow the streets, not like a normal plow truck, just right. like some big right. machine that's got to get the snow, so much lake effect snow out of the you way. You know what? I move snow up there. That's one thing yeah. we are well versed in. That's for sure. Yeah, that is for sure. So did you play sports growing up? I played baseball, just I stopped short of high school. My goal was to be a writer. Uh, I was more in the path of write for the school paper, learn everything you can about the game, uh, follow that path of trying to figure out in, in your in your 20s and in college what you want to write about and just kept getting pulled back to baseball, frankly. You know, I went to graduate school ultimately for journalism in my late 20s. Where did you go? I went to uh, graduate school at Columbia University here in New York. Oh. Yeah, and there, awesome. you know, everybody wants to be a foreign correspondent or cover the White House or something. And I was like, I want to cover the ball game. So, right. you know, at a place like that, that creates a niche, actually, uh, where, you know, maybe not a lot of people want to do that. But that's always what I was pulled toward. I think it does root back to uh, just being a kid and being at those games, seeing how magical it is, getting that little bit of interaction with players and just wanting to learn more, wanting to be that guy. So Cole's pitching tonight. If he if he gives up a game-winning home run, a game-tying home run in the sixth inning, chooses to throw a change-up, which is you know his third best pitch, I want to be the guy that can ask him why. What was he thinking? What you can portray uh, then, you know, on the air or in a story, what that what that moment is like, wh- why that decision was made, whatever, what have you. Right. So, uh, following, there's so many games in baseball. You have to get to know these players pretty intimately and understand them pretty well. I mean, there's. Mm-hmm. There, you know, there's five starting pitchers. There's a bunch of other guys. But you're going to know what Garrett Cole's, like you just said, it's his third best pitch is his changeup, right? So, but when you go and you find out, do you do you ever ask him, like, okay, right, Garrett, you're facing these guys tonight. How many times, how much film have you watched on them? You know, or is it is it more the is it more the manager? Is it the catcher? Or is it all of them put together that watches the film? It's all, all of it. Look, in a non-COVID, totally normal uh, world of coverage. We're not quite there yet. That's you might remember this from sports writers yourself. The good ones develop trusting relationships with people on the team. You work the room, you put in the time. So guys know, like if I talk to this guy, he's going to blow it up. It's going to be a big stupid headline. If I talk to that guy, he's just trying to understand the game. So you try to build those relationships and sure build that around. Talk to as many people as you can. Nothing like covering a big game. And my, and the, I've covered all, all the sports at one point or another overwhelmingly baseball. So the big game would be obviously the postseason in October. And you get to talk to the pitcher, the catcher, the opposing hitter, the managers, and you put together reporting that tells something people that the fans, something that they might uh, not have known. That's, that's very satisfying just to learn it for yourself. If you love the sport you cover just to selfishly to be able to learn that for yourself firsthand. Oh yeah. I saw that you worked for Philadelphia Inquirer. Yeah, right? I did. So yeah. uh, what other papers? So Philadelphia, New York, is that the only two cities you've been in? Or yeah, pretty been- much. I was lucky. I came up out of school. I was at the Daily News in New York, started as an intern and was able to cover Knicks, Jets, Giants, Yankees, Mets, and just get the full spectrum. Always baseball was the main goal, but would have been happy to do something else. But the, a job opened up covering the Phillies in their heyday during the Jimmy Rollins, Chase Utley, the Ryan right. Howard years. And I jumped at that and then came back to New York for the Daily News. Uh, for quite a few years. So I've, I've been very lucky to work for some great papers. Which fans make you more nervous, New York fans or Philly fans? That's a good question. The <laughs> The Philly fans are uh, the Philly baseball fans. That's what I covered in that town. It's such an Eagles town that there's a will to have the Phillies do well, but there's, there's more of an understanding in that town, I think, of football than baseball. So it's like you, you could try to make a point Point, maybe not land and you may might run into some trouble with your audience right. in New York. They can be brutal, but many of the readers at least kind of have an understanding. The challenge here is that you you might be writing to somebody that understands the game of baseball just as well, if not better than you do. So it's like yeah. a brain test in, in that regard. But in Philly, it's kind of, it was a little more for baseball, at least the team was good. The town was into it, but it was like win, lose, good, bad. It wasn't a lot of the subtleties. I, I'm yeah. Sure. Well, I, you know, that sounds a lot like Pittsburgh, right? That the Steelers are so good. Everybody's yeah. football minded yeah. here. Uh, you know, everybody's hockey minded because the Penguins have been so good. And then we get to the Pirates and we've like, we were really good in the 70s and kind of 80s. And then we just fell off. Yeah. And I think we lost a whole crazy generation of fans. 
You know, we're probably true in Pittsburgh. Yeah, unfortunately. You know, we, guys, people just want to go to the games that drink beer. They don't want to go to watch like these stars because we don't have any. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's a shame because I remember that, you know, a number of years ago when that was McCutcheon, Neil Walker teams did finally break through and get into the postseason. How crazy that ballpark was. People were hungry for it, but then they went uh, right yeah. back into their hole, you know, yeah. for the next several years. It's it it is difficult because I'm one of those people, right? Like I I play in a professional sport, but always being a fan of like my hometown, a couple other sports is is nuts. Because I remember the Cueto game when he, you know, the whole stadium is going crazy and he drops the ball on the mound and we win the game. It was it was just nuts. And and everybody in Pittsburgh realized what it could be. Yeah, but we just could never ever get over the top of that. Yeah, but, that's that's got to be tough as a fan. It seems to me too when I watch the games, and maybe you can tell me if I'm wrong, but New York has a different atmosphere than like a Pittsburgh. You know, where it's more, it's like you said, it's more they're more knowledgeable of the game. Where where Pittsburgh, it's more like blue. It's almost like blue collar and white collar. It feels yeah. like. Yeah. No, I think that's probably true. I mean, I don't want to go too far. Probably and saying like like. You know Pittsburgh certainly better than I do, but I will say from here, so without putting down another market, I would say from here there is a lot of uh, knowledge of what could happen on an individual pitch or when something special happens, why it's special, or when the team's not doing well. Like There was a game in New York where Gary Sanchez, the catcher, not known as the greatest base runner, made a base running blunder, ran from second to third on a ground ball to short, which you're not supposed to do. And the right. crowd knew exactly why. He, he yeah. up. And, you know, it, it's that attention to detail. Yeah, no that that makes that makes a lot of sense. So, tell me what was the most nervous that you have ever been to go up to somebody and ask them a question because there 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 are points where you know like like let's say I threw an interception at the last like couple parts of the game. I didn't really want like if anybody came up and asked me a question after the game, I really wanted to wring their neck, you know. But you knew you couldn't. But there's some intimidating people out there. So tell me about like a time that you remember that where you were super nervous to say, I got to ask this question. You know what? That It's not always the the person who was, you know, the losing pitcher in the game or whatever, the guy that made the error, because frankly, you know that that guy's teammates are looking for looking at that guy that screwed up to say like, are you professional enough to take the medicine with the media? Like I do when I screw up. So that, that I was always okay with. I mean, you feel bad sometimes, but it's the but, job. Right. It's a race job. For me, it's the more controversial stuff where someone might really be in trouble, uh, like something that might affect their lives. And well, what yeah, you're yeah, yeah. on might be true. You're like, gee, yeah, this is a big question I'm going to ask you. I'll give you a concrete example. When I was at the New York Daily News, we had this investigative team that did a great job investigating steroid and PED kind of stories. Right. And I, was, I was the Mets beat writer at the time. I was in San Francisco where Melky Cabrera, the outfielder, who was leading the league in batting was at that time. And nobody knew that there was anything fishy going on. Our paper did know that uh, he'd failed a PD, a steroid test and was going to be suspended at some point. So I get a call from the office. When you're covering the Mets Giants today, you have to go over to the Giants clubhouse. You have to ask Melky Cabrera if he failed the drug test. <laughs> it's only fair. If you're going right. to write it. Was he ask. holding a bat when you asked him? Was, that, was he holding a baseball bat when you had I don't think he was, but you know how a clubhouse can get like when I don't know if you guys oh, know yeah. how to give like a little bat signal to each other, but when it gets tense, you can feel everyone kind of circling oh, yeah. you or looking at you. And it was just like, Malky, yeah, sorry to ask you this. And you know, you're thinking like if this is a surprise to you, this might change the course of your life. But have you ever failed the steroid test? He lied. He said, No, I don't blame him for lying to me. Who am I in that moment? You know, right. he's not gonna admit it in that instance, but uh, it's things like that where you feel like, gee, this might be a good person who made a bad decision. And here I am about to ask this something major that those are tough. Yeah, I can I can see that 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 would be different than saying, oh, you you know, you made an error. You didn't throw it right the first base like what? You know, I mean, that's a lot different. I understand that. So yeah. in all of baseball history and all the incredible players that have played baseball, who is someone you you've always if you could go back and, and ask one question and interview somebody who would that be oh boy that is such a good question of people that i've covered or anyone in history oh no anyone in history back before you before you and i have both been alive there's some incredible players like that would just be like because i collect old baseball cards with my sons and like i have mm-hmm. a lot of vintage cards and some of them will read the back 
And it'd just be like, man, how awesome would it be to sit at dinner with that guy and find out what he's really like? Because yeah, they, they yeah. kind of used to explain it on the back of the cards. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like they told some incredible stories. So it's is there something that, that you would think that you would love to interview? It's funny. My gut answer to that is one is probably would be a complete waste because of the way he was with the press. But I like a challenge. And Ted Williams is always known as number one one of the most cerebral hitters of all time, wrote a book eventually about hitting in yeah. retirement and one of the most cantankerous, difficult guys that you could ever try to deal with. I always liked that challenge of trying to crack the guy that everyone else is scared of. We had a player in New York for a while when I was covering the Mets, Daniel Murphy, who put off this don't talk to me vibe. Yeah, and it yeah, made me true. want to try. And I'm like, well, if no one else is talking to the guy, he, I, I'm the only one that would get access to what he has to say if I could somehow crack that. Yeah. He became very friendly, and now he's retiring with text and stuff. It took me a lot of work. So I would have liked to have tried to be one of those Red Sox beat writers in the 40s and 50s and crack the Ted Williams mood and try to get him to teach me all about hitting. How's that? Oh, yeah. There was no – you have to talk to the media back in that day, no, right? Not, yeah, no. There was none of that. Get the F out of my face, kid. Yeah. Right? I could, exactly. I could just I see like, that them saying that. MO. So it would have been interesting to try to put in the time to see if you could get him out of that. Right, right. Yeah, you know, and, and it's amazing because I was talking with Adam Schefter – um, a little while ago, he came on the podcast. When we were talking about when I played for the Broncos, the Broncos were always known for their linemen never talking to the press, right? Oh, yeah. yeah, like that was a rule. Like if you caught talking to the the media, um, uh, you know, if you caught, caught talking to the media, you owed money. They find each other, and they did all these things. And Adam goes, "Yeah, they said that out loud, but you know, after like a meeting, I'd be in." going to breakfast with them or something. And they'd be giving me all this inside scoop. And as long as I didn't say that I was talking to a lineman, they gave me all kinds of scoop. But I'm like, that's a great that's thing about funny. anonymous sourcing. You right. Can, all kinds of people could talk to you when they pretend that they uh, didn't. That's how you Adam, get information. <laughs> Adam is the king of anonymous sourcing. Yeah. Right. When I, when that's I, those trusting relationships. You know, honestly, if you overdo it with anonymous sources in my line of work, it, right. you have to be careful. But, and if you abuse them and use them to do, take cheap shots or whatever, but if you get people to trust you and say, look, don't put my name on this. Don't blow me up. But this is what's actually going on in here. That, that's that's the relationships of being a good sports writer, I think. Yeah. So, you know, when you look at the Yankees, I mean, if you're a Yankee, it almost you, you become a star, right? Mm -hmm. Like instantly. You put those pinstripes on, you become a star. And there's some pretty famous Yankees, you know. And so when I think about like, you know, people like A-Rod, and, and, you know, they're playing all these games and you get to interview him and he is like almost larger than life just because of the money he's made and the, the greatness he, he did on the field. What is that like for you when you go and interview an A-Rod and, and we are, when you get close to them, it, 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 it's kind of cool. Does your, do, do people call it, these, you know what I mean? It's a great story to tell. Yeah, it is. I, I had a, I really had a lot of fun, um, Alex wasn't having so much fun at this time, but covering <laughs> when he was in, in 2013, August 2013, the big story in baseball. Hard to imagine how big now because he's kind of settled in as a broadcaster, but right, he right. was given this record suspension for PEDs. He was suing right. the union. He was suing the Yankees. He was suing the league. It was this war. And in the middle of all that, he comes back because he's appealing the suspension uh, in Chicago, a game against the White Sox. And it's not just sports media at that point it's cable news it's you know everything it's like the story and to be someone who can actually be covering the sport be there you want to talk to a ball player and, and be in the middle of a, ma a major national story like that we don't always get that with sports so it's cool yeah and those guys like a-rod is and jeter this in a different way but guys who uh they know that they're big cultural figures and big celebrities and it's not as easy to get them one-on-one -on -one as it is with you know the backup catcher obviously or right or so it's kind of operating on a different level. It's almost like you're covering a movie star or something. And you're, what you see in the locker room is, is can be a performance. And, and uh, it's, it's, which is fine. You understand why people who are that famous have to keep their guard up to protect themselves in some ways. But yeah, it right. is cool when you're right. There is a presence of that. And in baseball particularly, it takes a lot for baseball to break through. Obviously, it's not the most popular sport in America. So when you've got a huge star like A-Rod or a big story like that, uh, from my end of it, you, you try to have fun with it. Yeah, I mean, you have to because it is. It's it's like, you know, I, you might be able to, 
But if I went and asked the normal person, name one person from the Yankees, name one person from the Pirates, mm-hmm. I guarantee you they're not going to name anybody from the Pirates, right. right? And they'll probably name McCutcheon, <laughs> right. yeah, who's yeah, been right. on like three teams since the Pirates. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, so it, it is crazy, you know, and, and um, uh, you know, it's just it's just amazing to me that, that you know, and there's so many games. And and your work is is every day. Mm-hmm. So how do you focus to where you can go every day, write a new story, or you just kind of are you just focus on the data and analytics of the game, or are you trying to write a story about you know what I mean, like more yeah. of a storyline? Yeah, sure. I, well, when you're a team beat writer traveling with a team, that takes up all your energy and time to describe. Oh, imagine. Happen. Yeah, try to break a few stories. I did that for years. Uh, now I'm in a position where I, I'm not on the road as much as one of those people, one of those beat reporters. So I'm able to focus on news, really just lead with news. Like I try to wake up with in the morning, like what can I report today that people don't know? And it doesn't right. have to be a big Adam Schefter style huge scoop. It can just be a little thing. Right. Try to learn something and lead with that is a good way to look at it. And then when you get the chance to write longer things, whether it's features or books, you know, having the time. I don't write game stories anymore. Uh, in fact, unfortunately, with newspapers dying out, that's a bit of a dying art overall. But right. not doing that frees you up to look at news, features, go a little deeper. Maybe I don't have to write about the main thing that's going on that day. I can write about something else that's also interesting that's going on. Yeah. So you're just looking. Every time you publish a story or go on the air and talk, Gus, you just want to be interesting. You want to not repeat the same thing that people – uh, that everyone else covering the team does. And that's the beauty of reporting. If you're doing a well and you find out something fresh, then you have something interesting to say. Yeah. And, and I think you guys are such a big part of, uh, you mentioned it, like baseball is not the most fan favorite sport in the U S right now, but mm-hmm. you guys have a major part of making it that way, right? That, that you can make it sound and seem with new technologies and, you know, way to get in fan engagement. I don't think that it's only players, but it's the people telling the stories to make those players seem great uh, to make the game interesting, to, to figure out how to get more people involved. Well, please clip that off and send it to the Major League Baseball Players Association <laughs> because there's a CBA coming up and we're worried about access. So yeah. I think everything you we're going to put that up for you. Yeah, please do. Yeah, no, it's just, it's just, it is a way. Like I, I went, I've always been a big baseball fan and played it in high school and everything. But, um, you know, I, I'm an armchair baseball, mm-hmm. baseball guy, but it does need to figure out. And I've been racking my brain. I'm sure you do too. Is how do we get people engaged in it better? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it's tough. It, it's a very rewarding sport, but it requires a lot of attention and, and attention to detail. I mean, it's not always, you can have a great time having a beer and half paying attention. Oh Yeah. <laughs> But it's not know. definitely not a TikTok kind of game. No, no. But but I think the pace of it and the fact that like you look at a field and you go, nothing's happening. If you really know the game, you know there are signs being given, stolen. There are uh, positionings. There's all kinds of strategy going on. The manager's brain's always going 100 miles in a minute. And there's a lot to notice if you learn. But I do think it's tough to uh, – initially introduce it to someone who might not have the attention span for it, unfortunately. Oh yeah. I'm halfway through my nachos and nothing even happened yet, you know, but yeah. like you're saying, but there has been stuff that's happened, right? right? The, the right. coach gave the sign, the guy missed the sign. He got caught, you know, there's all kind of stuff going on at base. I mean, I, I get it. I get it, but it just isn't that, you know, right. I've always, I'm always trying to figure out what can make it that TikTok kind of thing. Now, when you do the, no. it's hard, like maybe, more more home runs. I told my son he was driving uh, down to go to a, a camp today, and I and we we both watch baseball and we 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 love it. And he said, "Mad m- dad, maybe the games will be like twelve, you know, twelve to ten now if the pitchers can't yeah. uh, grease the balls up." I said, "I don't know. I mean, these guys still throw hundred miles an hour. They, they do. Let's start it. That I think we'll get a little more action, and that'll help. And now baseball's trying to." figure things out, whether it's banning the infield shifts, something they've thought about, or even legislating how many times you can throw over to first. It's a pitcher for pickoff moves to inspire more stolen bases. They know they need more action. But at the end of the day, I think either you love the sport or maybe you don't. Do you think there's ever going to be another Ricky Henderson, still that many bases? That's tough to see. That's a great question. You know, Teams just know now that it's rare that somebody 
major league teams say like if you can't be successful 75 percent of the time stealing it's not worth it it hurts our offense by the percentages so basically that discourages stolen bases but baseball like mlb is trying to find ways to make teams incentivize them to do that because everyone knows how exciting it is when you're in the ballpark and the guy takes off so that's something they're trying to encourage in terms of a ricky henderson no i don't think we go back to that yeah. style of baseball that's with so many stolen bases yeah, so hey, I know we got a short time. So tell us what you're doing now and what we can uh, look for on the internet from you. Sure. Well, uh, uh, the, you can look at, you can find my stuff every day at smy.tv. That's where I cover MLB, Yankees, and Mets. I have a book out called Cheated, which goes into detail, goes on the stuff that we kind of just discussed in the abstract, which is uh, the things going on under the surface, the signs being given, the signs being stolen, not just what the Astros did, but what all teams are doing to a very degree, many teams for, for, for a long time. Uh, I would have to assume the Astros weren't the only one. They were not the only ones. I do believe that they took it to an extent that pushed it past what was kind of the standard at that time. But yeah, the whole point is sign stealing and cheating and gamesmanship have been going on in the sport for mo well over a century Oh yeah, uh, and what is it? I wanted to take the reader inside the game to talk, to really do all the things, and I didn't make this connection on, on purpose in our conversation, Gus. But you asked me good questions, and all these things that I love about the game, the access to the players, the, what do they say, what are they doing, what's really going on, is what I was trying to portray uh, in that book. So it, it's about the Astros, but it's kind of about my love for the game and all the things that happen there too. So that's you can find that anywhere you, you buy a book, and you can find me on SNY uh, Network if you're in New York or smy.tv if you're online and where can we follow you on uh social media it's at martino myc on twitter oh awesome you know you know it's kind of funny we're talking about the astros and you know they were using like the garbage can thing and i'm like there's all this new crazy technology out there uh that that you could i mean we're it's it's just incredible what we're creating now in mm -hmm. regards to technology and the astros are using a garbage can to to mm -hmm. bang on and to say like this is a fastball this is whatever <laughs> you know but obviously they were using cameras and some other stuff but i just laugh at that like the it's simplicity true. It's a of it tech, like the thing that <laughs> sticks in your mind and that's part of why it was so it's like as you said, there's high speed cameras that get them the live feed that allows them to look at the sign and bang the trash can. But there's a lot of people that were involved with that team then that were like, What? Why were we so stupid to do something that basic, bang on a trash can? For all the intelligence, that was like the most analytically <laughs> savvy organization ever. Funk. You're absolutely right. It is kind of funny. Right. Like, who was the guy in the locker room that came up with the idea? That's what I want to know. Like, like, you know, uh, I, I'm trying to think of one of the players just like standing in the locker room. Hey, guys, yeah. I got this great idea. <laughs> yeah, you know, right. do they all just turn and look at him in their chairs and be like, What are you nuts? You know what? I think it was org it was organic the way it was told <laughs> they could add the screen, they had the signs. They tried to use one of those mas massage guns called a Theragun, where you kind of it's like a drill, they right. drill it into the back of the bench so you hear the sound. Sometimes it was too loud for that. They tried clapping. They tried whistling. And I think it was as simple as, hey, there's a, hey, there's a trash can there in the corner. <laughs> it's like, how about that? It yeah. Evolved like, like that. Just evolved like that. And, <laughs> and you're thinking like, like some in high school, I get that, right? But yeah. like Major League Baseball, really? I so. hear you. Yeah, it's awesome. Well, hey, Andy, I really appreciate you joining. I know we 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 only had a half hour with you, and sorry we were a little late there. But uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I appreciate your time. Everyone, check out Andy. Um, I it, think it's at Marchino yeah, NYC. NYC yeah. Yep, and uh, check him out on the SNY Network and check out his new book, Cheated. Um, and, and it was great. I had a lot of fun. I love talking baseball because my whole life's been football. But, yeah. uh, you know, I appreciate you coming on. Enjoy your time back in Yankee Stadium. And, uh, you know, good luck against the Royals today. Fun. Huddle up with Gus listeners, Manscaped. They sent me, uh, they hooked me up with a bunch of tools and formulations for their package 3.0 kit. Uh, so, you know, I want to show you guys what's in the perfect package, right? We all think we got a perfect package, but they sent me the perfect package 3.0 kit. I want to show you what they sent me. So it was crazy. It came in this great box. Um, you know, and you can see what it says. They will thank you because they send us this awesome trimmer. They sent us, uh, you know, stuff that makes you smell better. 
And then, uh, you know, they sent me this great, uh, some boxers even, which you get, right? Protect them. And then, uh, you know, they sent me this uh, cool sack, I guess you want to call it, to store all your stuff in. So uh, it's been great. Uh, Manscaped sent me a bunch of products, um, you know, and, and, you know, you can see it all on here. Uh, you know, you can go to manscaped.com and put in the code uh, Gus Ferrat, that's G-U-S-F-R-E-R-O-T-T-E, get 20% off and free shipping when you use that code. But you can get a kit, you can get individual items, like um, this way cool groomer that has a little LED light, um, ceramic, uh, these things come apart, they're waterproof, you can do a lot with them. So, uh, you know, Manscaped is great. You know, it's, it's funny, I remember when I was playing with the Denver Broncos, and I'm not gonna mention any names, but uh, there was a gentleman who was playing on our team. And, uh, you know, if he ever hears the story, he'll know exactly what I'm talking about. But uh, he brought his own clippers in one time. And he used it to trim his beard up, his goatee and everything. And uh, he had them there for about two or three weeks. And he goes in around the corner. He walks in. And there's a person, another player, that is actually manscaping with his beard trimmer. So, you know, one of the things is you don't want to use the same trimmer down there that you use up here. So uh, he kind of freaked out a little bit. And he said, hey, how long have you been using that tool there? And he said, well, it showed up here about three weeks ago and I've been using it ever since. So, you know, there is a lesson learned that, uh, you know, don't leave things out. And probably if it would have just said manscaped on it, we wouldn't have had that issue. But it's probably one of the funniest uh, taking care of your ball stories I've ever heard or been around in the locker room in the NFL. So uh, it's a great story. Um, but, you know, I always said there was no way to know. There was no name on it. And the guy was just using it. And another guy was using it. It was, it, it was not good. But it's a heck of a funny story. So one of the best I've ever heard in my 15 years playing in the league. Um, but, you know, there's so many great things about Manscaped and what they're doing. Uh, because guys, you got to take care of yourself. Even though I got gray hair um, and getting older, but uh, you still have to maintain some sort of uh, grooming, right? And so, uh, you know, we all work out. For me, I like working in my yard, doing those things now that I'm retired, getting a little sweat on and everything. You want to smell good? Uh, you know, you got to take care of yourself. They got some great products. Um, you know, this one. A little uh, ball deodorant. We all need that here and there. Um, after you know, working the yard, taking a hike, doing a walk, whatever you do, um, it's a great thing. But uh, there's so many great products. Um, I want to thank Manscaped for sending them to me. Um, the Lawnmower 3.0. Obviously, you can use it anywhere in your body. But I'm sure you guys have all seen the commercials. But uh, this is one. Just letting you know that uh, the lawnmower 3.0 comes with the perfect kit you can buy the lawnmower by itself you can buy all these products individually they even sent me this wonderful shirt and you can see the back your balls will thank you and then here's the front so it's an awesome shirt they have great gear and you know what sometimes you can just sit back take care of your balls a little bit and and, and read the paper so I think Manscaped even has their own daily news, so which is great. So don't forget that uh, you can go to the code Gus Ferrat, and uh, that's G U S F R E R O T T E, uh, and you can save twenty percent on any products. The complete, the perfect uh, package gift set, and uh, you know you can save twenty percent and get free shipping. So use the code Gus Ferrat, G U S. F-R-E-R-O-T-T-E. Hey, everybody spells my name wrong. They even spelled it wrong in the back of my Pro Bowl jersey. So, you know, I got I to gotta help you guys out. So don't forget how important it is that you use these products. Take care of yourself down below and have some fun, right? There's nothing closer to you than your little buddies. So use the lawnmower. Uh, use the code Gus Ferrat. Save 20% and get free shipping. 
and uh, order some great Manscaped products. All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Huddle Up with Gus. I'm your host, Gus Farratt. 15-year NFL quarterback, and I want to welcome you into 1631 Digital News Studio. Thank you to 1631 for always hosting us, and uh, I want to thank my team, Terry Schulman, uh, Brian, our super producer, and uh, Joe Corby down at 1631 for, for always helping us out. And then uh, we want to thank Sounder FM for hosting us and hosting our podcast on their platform. Sounder does an incredible job, and i um, you know, uh, they just, with all the new technologies today and the way they transcribe audio, they've just been uh, heads above the rest. So thank you to Sounder FM. And we want to thank our new partner, uh, Vegas Sports Advantage. Uh, go to Vegas Sports Advantage and really, um, you know, uh, you can go there uh, and hopefully, like, just like our last guest, uh, maybe our next guest, guest will give us some insight on maybe who you should pick in betting and, and make you some more money. So today our guest is a three-time New York Times bestselling uh, author Lee Monville, and he's a former columnist for the Boston Globe and former senior writer at Sports Illustrated. He's written way too many books for me to go through and talk about because I'll screw them all up. But, uh, you know, uh, his new one, Tall Man in Short Shorts, Lee, uh, thank you for joining me on Huddle Up with Gus. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. You can go through all the books if you want. Go right ahead. Oh, okay. Not ready? Uh, Sting like a bee, evil, the mysterious Montag, yeah. uh, the Big Bam, Ted Williams, at the altar of speed, Minute, and why not us? And then your new one. How about that? Is that all right? It's a fine crew of people, isn't it? You know, it's, <laughs> they're like little toys I could take out and play in, play in my room, you know? It's, it's, it uh, is. It is. Uh, well, I was kind of laughing because we were, before you got on, we were talking about your new book. And uh, you're going talking about tall men in short shorts. And I said, wait, I got a, I got a picture. So check this out, Lee. This is me. My parents made this back in high school for my basketball. And look at those short shorts. There you go. I said, I had a little mustache and I had braces and I, one of my ankles was destroyed from basketball. So there it you go. It didn't seem my... weird at all. <laughs> yeah. It didn't seem weird at all. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know why my parents wanted that of me. And then my mom gives it, gives it to me in a big box and stuff. And now my kids just laugh at it. So, so Lee, tell me about where you grew up and, and like kind of your first uh, realization that you had a passion for sports. Well, I, I, I was like an only child. Um, and, and I hung around with all the guys and you have to figure out, I think when you're an only child, how, how you're going to get inside with everybody, you know? Right. And, and sports seemed like the, the best ticket. I, I was the kid who always knew about the trades that were coming and where the teams were playing and what happened last night. And, uh, you know, I, I was like a little blabbermouth kid. And when I was in fifth grade, this was in New Haven, Connecticut. And when I was in fifth grade, I handed in a book report. And the teacher, Marie Esposito, said, come see me. And when, after she handed out all the book reports, she didn't hand out mine. And I went up to see her and she handed me my book report. And she said, you know, you're a very good writer. You, you, you should be a writer. Uh, that would be, and so I don't know, I was, that's the only teacher I ever had anywhere at any time <laughs> who gave me any kind of confidence, but I took it like that's a ticket to my life. That's I'm awesome. a writer. And I used to deliver the paper and uh, in the mornings and I would get done delivering my papers and there was a kid who sold papers at the corner and we would get together and we, we would eat eat breakfast like Hostess cupcakes and uh, grape soda for breakfast and we would read the paper and there was a guy in my town, Frank Birmingham, he was the sports editor. He had his little picture in the side of the paper and he was always going to the World Series and the Kentucky Derby and all this stuff, Yale football, which was a yeah. big thing. And I said, that guy's got the greatest thing in the uh, greatest job in the world. And I said, that's, that's what I'm going to be. And so when I was 10 years old, I was thinking of doing this. And uh, I'm the only guy, you know, who was 10 years old who wound up doing what he wanted to do. Yeah, that's amazing that I, I love that story. Because when you're young and, and you have these dreams and you want to figure out what you want to do, they, they barely 
you know, stay in the same job, you know, or even the same field. You know, when you're young, you some a lot of a lot of kids were like, oh, I want to be a fireman and all these things. You knew you wanted to be a writer that early. So you must have loved reading the paper if you could remember all those things, because I knew a couple of kids like that. That's a lot of work. Yeah, but but I was like, um, I was an indifferent student. Um, but when I got to college, I got involved in the in, in the paper at the University of Connecticut and uh, and wound up as the editor at the end. And away I went. Away well, you went. So you went to Connecticut. You, you're the editor of the paper. Now, what was your like? What was your main goal? Was it more sports or was it just all over college? No, I I, I was in, I was the sports editor as a junior in, in college, and and, and I. That I became the editor. I thought that would be a good career move, but I found out I hated all all that real world stuff. I, yeah. you know, I I was going to games. I was covering the UConn Huskies. They went to the NCAA tournament and all that stuff. And and now I was kind of covering meetings of student government and stuff like that. Yeah. The community chess carnival and stuff. I said, what am I doing? I mean, I wanted to go to sports, and and, and I've stuck with it. I, I've had chances to become different things. And, and I said, what's better than sports? Pe- people pay attention to sports. And, and you know, there's, there's that old thing, microcosm of life. There's everything in sports. I mean, you, you, I'm sure you've come across, you know, medical situations, legal situations, life and death situations. It, it's all in sports. It's like, um, like a town that we all know about. Yeah, there's a lot of, uh, I mean, obviously sports, there's a lot of intrigue in it. Uh, There's always a new storyline, every game that's played, because there's nothing written for it, right? It all happens right there, and you get to watch it unfold in front of your eyes. And I'm sure being an editor of a paper, it's not like, hey, we got to go cover the science fair that just came in, and it's going to take 12 hours, right? Like, it's happening, and you get to cover all kind of stuff. So, what did that lead you on to after college? Like, what did you, like, where did you, what was your next step? Well, the, the, the first thing I said, where would I like to do this? Where would I like to be a sports writer? And I said, well, I'd like to go to Sports Illustrated. That's the big place. But I, I didn't know anything about how you got to Sports Illustrated. So I, I, I looked it up where the office was and it was in New York City. And I, I called up Sports Illustrated and said, I want to, apply to be a writer. And this woman from human resources said, right. uh, well, you can make an appointment. You can kind of come down. So I got my little Anderson little suit on and, and, and my little attache case with my, right. my clippings. And I took the train from New Haven and, and I showed up and uh, it, it, that the offices were right across from Radio City. And I walked in and, and they said, well, you can wait in the waiting room. And there were two guys waiting there and, and they kind of had sweatshirts and blue jeans on and they were talking Spanish to each other. And so we're all waiting, the three of us. And, and, and they said, are you waiting for Miss So-and-so? And I said, well, yeah. And they said, we are too. We, we're applying to be custodians. And I said to myself, this is probably <laughs> not how you get a job at Sports <laughs> Illustrated. Yeah. And, and lo and behold, it wasn't, you know. <laughs> yeah. the, woman, the woman just foisted me off and said, said basically, Martin, you know, Go, go someplace really scary. So I went back to my hometown, New Haven. I became a sports writer there. Then I went to Boston and I was a sports writer there and then Sports Illustrated. And now, and now I'm 100 years old. Well, how did you get to the point where you wanted to take your sports, like your, you know, when, when you're um, a columnist and you're writing for the papers, when did you make that switch to say, okay, I want to write books. I want to write full stories. I want to take my time with all of this? You know, I, I always, I think in the back of my head, I always wanted to be Ernest Hemingway or, or, or some great novelist, you know? Right, right. And I, I stayed away from writing a sports book because a guy, a friend, this guy, Tom Callahan, who, who worked in Cincinnati, he said, you can't write Charlie Hustle, the Pete Rose story, and also write The Sun Also Rises, you know what I mean? People don't open the book and see also by Ernest Hemingway, Charlie right. Hustle, the Pete Rose story, you know? Right. And I stayed away from writing. Um, but then I, I, I did a story for Sports Illustrated on, on, on Minute Bowl. And he was just the most fascinating guy I ever come across, you know? It, 
he'd come here from the Sudan, seven foot seven. He he couldn't couldn't read or write English, and when he got over and uh, blah blah blah, he had to learn how to how to hold a pencil. You know, I mean that's yeah. how basic it was, and uh, and it, it it was just a fascinating story. So I, I kind of put out a couple of feelers and. Uh, and I wrote a book about Manute Bull, which sold about seven. You know, I think mostly to people from Sudan named Bull, but right, his son Bull in. Bull has one, right? Yeah, yeah, that's his son. Yeah, he must yeah. Have one. Um, I bet that would have been like very interesting. Did you did you fly over to back to where he was from, or did you just do I, interviews? I actually did. I I I I convinced Sports Illustrated to send me to the African Basketball Championships where they were gonna settle on the one team that was gonna play in the Olympics. And that was in Cairo, Egypt. And I went there. So I was on Sports, Illustrate, Sports Illustrated's dime to go to right. Cairo, nice. Egypt. And then I took my own money and I flew down to the Sudan, um, Khartoum, which, uh, which was just a fascinating place, you know? And uh, they had no, no street signs, no phone books, no nothing, you know? And, uh, and they, had, they had a, uh, you, you had to be be inside your house by eleven o'clock or ten o'clock at night, and it, it was a fascinating place. Uh, Did you get to meet his family? Not really. Um, I, I met his cousin. His he had a cousin that was working in the U.S. Embassy in Cairo, um, but no, I met like his 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 coach. I yeah. mean, he, the guy, the guy was in the jungle. He lived in the jungle in a tribe in the jungle, and. He was seven foot seven and some some minister for the government went to the, the part of the jungle where he lived and they took a picture of the minister standing with 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 this guy who was seven foot seven in the middle of the jungle. And they published the pay, the, 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 the article in, in the cartoon paper. Right. And and the guys that were on the national basketball team in cartoon said, Whoa, seven foot seven. We should find out about this guy. <laughs> yeah, right. And, they, and sure enough, they they tracked him down and they brought him to Khartoum. And and he learned. I mean, he he was like seventeen years old when he first touched the basketball. I oh mean, my gosh! He, you know, it was very late in the game, and and but he but he had a real aptitude for blocking shots. Oh he, yeah. He couldn't. He couldn't really. He couldn't palm the ball very well because he had kind of arthritic fingers. So yeah. he only dunked the ball holding it with two hands. So he was never, never a threat like that. But he, he became a three-point threat. Don Nelson had him shooting up three points. Yeah, it's that crazy. I, I mean, I remember him very well. I remember yeah. him very well. Yeah. And, and I couldn't imagine, like, he was skinny in the NBA. I couldn't imagine him yeah. at 17 how skinny he would have been. Yeah. He probably had to add 50 pounds to him. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and he everywhere he went, Everybody loved him. He played at the University of Bridgeport for a year and everybody loved him. Chris Mullen's brother played with him at, at Bridgeport. And then it, when, I, when I met him, he was playing with the Sixers with uh, Charles Barkley and Ricky Mahorn. And they, they, would, they, they would attack him and they would throw him on the ground for seven. And they would take all his tape and they'd make him like a mummy, you know? <laughs> they would take him there and he'd be swearing at him in Arabic and... Uh, <laughs> He was, uh, he, he was quite a character, you know? Oh, I could imagine. You know, and I think that's what's great about what you're doing is that, that when you take time and you write a book about somebody, you get to know all these incredible details about people. And it lets you, uh, people like you bring them really to life with us, right? Because we know Manu Bull is this guy, like you said, block shots in the NBA, but your yeah. books tell us a, a great story about them and, and, and it brings them to life for all of us. So I thank you for doing all that. I mean, I mean, you've written a, a, an amazing amount of books on, on some athletes. So what was your most intriguing one that you've done to you? I don't know that probably, I mean, Ted Williams, I did a book on Ted Williams and he was kind of, kind of boyhood idol. You know? And he, he was, uh, well, he didn't really like to talk to reporters and people, did he? He not well, but after playing, he was fine. You now, um, and he was a big guy, and and he he kind of boomed things out. Everybody said he 
he resembled John Wayne, you know, he was like, like John Wayne. And uh, he, he was terrific. He, he, he swore better than any man in the history of, of swearing, you know, and he, yeah. he colorful and, and uh, he, he was great, he was great. Uh, yeah, well, I, I learned my first swear word from my dad when I was like six, so I uh-huh. understand that what that means. Yeah, but together in unique, you know, he, he wasn't just, and when he said, when he said, God, damn it, he meant, God damn it. He, I mean, he was calling on God to, to damn whatever it was. So he was, <laughs> that was just a little paprika. He, he was spreading on the oh, night. Yeah. He was to, he, he, he had big loves and big hates and uh, he was just a big guy. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. So when you wrote about evil, Knievel, did he let you get on one of his bikes and do a jump? No, evil was evil was gone when I when I wrote about him. You, he was uh, gone already. Yeah, yeah. When so did you get to talk to his son? I talked to his. I talked to all these guys he hung around with, and he he was kind of he, he was not the world's greatest person, you know. I mean, really? He, yeah, no. I mean, he. Uh, he made it. He borrowed a lot of money that he never paid back, and he he wound up with other guys' wives. And he he was oh my gosh. He, he was he was a, a kind of con man kind of guy. He he, he wasn't a, a real good guy, but he had that one thing. I mean, he had he had testicles the size of <laughs> you know the Appalachian Mountains. You know, yeah, <laughs> that's I mean, great. And, and he didn't. I mean, the guys that do it now. They, they figured out all the geometry of how you're supposed to do it, when you should take off and when you shouldn't take off. He just did it by, by I don't know, by the seat of his pants. You know, he, he would say, I'm going to jump these 23 cars and I should kind of get, get the motorcycle up to 85 or 90 miles an hour right about here. And he would do it. And sometimes he would be short and he would crash. And so the next time, he would say, well, I got to get it up to 95 miles an hour. Yeah. And he would be long and he would crash, you know? I mean, he, 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 he was just a, a total seat of the pants guy. Yeah. I think I would break one bone, like crash one time, break a bone and be like, yeah, I don't really want to do this. How many bones did he break? Uh, he, he broke, you know, he always, he always, of course said he broke every bone in his body. And you know, <laughs> right. He, I mean, that, that Caesar's Palace crash, you everybody's seen that, you know, yeah. where he flips and goes over and over. He, he just that was the foundation for all his success, you know, that he could go on, go on Mike Douglas or Johnny Carson, show that reel and and just say, Yeah, I broke every bone in my body, and uh, you should come out to the fairgrounds on Saturday night and see me. Uh, and watch me destroy myself. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and he, Wide World of Sports, you know, I mean, it was a different time back then. Everybody oh, yeah. watched Wide World of Sports, and, and, and he became a big player on Wide World of Sports. He, 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 brought in, he brought in great numbers for them. Oh, I mean, my Wide World of Sports memory is the Winter Olympics, the guy going down the ski ramp and yeah. like falling off the side and crashing. Yeah. Like that was yeah. always what they played because they knew that was going to get people to watch. Yeah. Evil, evil was falling off the side. Every- yeah, <laughs> all the time. All the time. So tell us about your new book. The new book is called Tall Men Short Shorts, and it's about the 1969 NBA Finals. It's a... Uh, the Lakers and the Celtics. Um, it was the last time that Russell played against Chamberlain. Um, Jerry West and, uh, and, and Elgin Baylor played for the Lakers. John Havlicek played for the Celtics. Um, and I was 25 years old. I, I was just starting out. And uh, I, through, through a number of circumstances, I wound up covering the whole seven games. I covered the Celtics for the whole playoffs. Oh. I, had, I had never been to California. I'd never seen a palm tree. I'd never seen the Pacific Ocean. I'd never seen anything. And I was dealing with Bill Russell, who, who was 10 years older than me and far right. more famous. And he was the coach. He was the coach um, and, the, and the star player. And the Boston Globe, my paper, had hired him to also do a column after every game. Oh, so, really? Yeah. And he had nobody else. I mean, you see the NBA now 
and and you look at those guys they all wear they they're, they're all wearing those little zipper zipper hood things now you know at the games all the yeah. coaches and the assistants they look like the mormon tabernacle mormon tabernacle knuckle choir there's so right. many of them. whereas he he was the coach and the star and there was nobody else the trainer kind of kind of made all the, the the reservations and stuff and wrapped the ankles and that was it i mean that was wow. the whole, whole operation and and i'm kind of join joining the fun here and and in that in that series i mean television in boston only two of the seven games were on television. That's it. And, That's and, amazing. Yeah. I mean, they had the concept then of, of blacking out home games. And so in Los Angeles, only, only three of the games were on television. Um, and I and, hate when they do that. Yeah. And it, I mean, they said it ruins the gate and it was a, it was a faulty idea, but the yeah. idea that, that there was no, that there was no television and the games were starting at 11 o'clock in Los Angeles, Eastern time. And, you know, you, you only could hear, hear the game on radio. They had a guy, Johnny Most, he had a scratchy voice and he'd say, here we are at the Los Angeles Forum. And blah, blah, blah. And, and he gave one account and I gave another account. I mean, it, you weren't getting a lot of information. We were the ones who were telling the whole story. Yeah, you were the guys. And, were the, and, and the I'm 25 years people. old and I'd never seen a palm tree before. And, and, uh, you know, I mean, when Bill Russell had been playing, I was in junior high school when he right. was playing for the Celtics. So, uh, it, it was an experience. So it's, it's about all the games. It went seven games and the Celtics won in the seventh game. They were the big underdog and they won the seventh game. Uh, th th there was strangeness at the end. Wilt took himself out with a, with a knee injury and then wanted to come back in and coach Bill von Bredikoff. He wouldn't put him back in, and uh, and the Celtics won in, in in seven games, and they had a big they had a big celebration planned for the forum. They had all these balloons up on the ceiling, and they oh, had they were ready. Big, they had the USC band was there. Oh my um, gosh! Was going to play Happy Days or Here Again. They were kind of marching on the court, and uh, they had a big victory cake. They had you know five five cases of champagne in the locker room, and the Celtics put a damper on the whole thing and. Red Arback was just screaming. Uh, he was the general manager, and he was screaming, "What about the balloons? What are they going to do about the balloons? <laughs> Where's our champagne? They might still be there." Yeah. Yeah, that's funny. That's that's incredible. So, why so long to write this story? Well, you know, I was 25 then. Now I'm 77 years old. I'm 100. You know, and you, you get to that age, and you start telling stories and, and you realize everybody else in your story is not with us anymore. You know, I mean, you start, right. you know, you start talking about, I was there with George Washington when he got the wooden teeth and uh, <laughs> you say, wait a minute, nobody else was there with George Washington got the wooden teeth. So it, it's, it, it's a whole, it's, it's a tale of a whole other era, you know, really um, that whole thing about no television and, and being a sports writer was different. I mean, there were only, there were only like three guys covering the Celtics uh, out on the West coast. And, you know, you would just go talk with guys. You'd go to their rooms and talk with them and you'd hang out. And, you know, well, yeah. A hundred people, people with microphones standing around a, a big page that has advertisements for to be, you know, and it's anymore. Nobody, Nobody really tells a story about about growing up and, and to the paper and their fifth grade teacher. It's all, you know, what'd you do on the day? What'd you think? But but you were also what the people had to what you know, like if yeah. the Celtics were out of town, you were what they had to read. And yeah. you were the one that explained the whole game. I mean, I get that. Like that that was what it was. When we were when we were a kid, we had we you know, we had to read the paper. That's it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, who, you know, who was the big sports writer in, in, in Pittsburgh when you were a kid? Oh, gosh, I couldn't tell you. I just remember we had the leader times. That was it. Oh, OK. We read the leader times Pittsburgh? all the time. No, I was a little town outside of Pittsburgh. My town is only about 5000 people. Oh, OK. I was all just right. right outside of Pittsburgh. I was okay, just right yeah, outside yeah. of Pittsburgh. But yeah, yeah. yeah Lee, I, I, you know, I appreciate it. Um, so how can people how can our fans get your book? I don't know. They. 
they can go right now to Amazon.com, you know, I mean, like half the books in the world are sold on Amazon now, you know, and you can, you can order in advance and uh, it to you. And then it's going to be on, you know, hopefully it's going to be in everybody's bookstore on uh, July 13th. Awesome. Awesome. So tell us again, Lee, what the name of your book is. Um, Tall Men, Short Shorts. It's a, it's a story about Russell, uh, Lakers and the, the Celtics and the Lakers, Russell and West and, and one uh, very young sports writer. Right. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, Lee, I appreciate you joining us and taking the half hour or out of your day and sharing all your stories. So everyone, you can check out Lee Montville and all his books that he's written in his newest book, Tall Men, Short Shorts. Uh, just some incredible stories. And Lee, I liken it to when my grand, my, my daughter went up to her, her great grandpa and asked him about World War II and videoed the whole thing so that we always have it. It's a story, yeah. unless it's written down or videoed, we'll never know about it. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Lee. Everyone, take care. Thank you for joining us on Huddle Up with Gus, and I look forward to next week. Thank you very much. Take care. Have a great day. Huddle Up with Gus is brought to you by Vegas Sports Advantage. Clients of Vegas Sports Advantage are winning big in 2021, and you can be a part of the winning too. As of June 1st, $100 bettors are up $3,700. $500 bettors are up $18,500 and $1,000 bettors are up $37,000 and $5,000 bettors are up $185,000. Become a client today by clicking the link in the description below and use promo code HUDDLEUP to take 25% off your package today thanks to our partnership. And that's a wrap, sports fans. Thanks for joining in the fun at the 1631 Digital Studios for another action packed Huddle Up with Gus, featuring 15 year NFL quarterback Gus Verrat. Huddle Up with Gus is proudly produced by 1631 Digital Media and is available on Apple Music.